Hi again, this is Andy, K4GKP, and welcome back to the Ham Whisper and Lesson 26 in the General Class Operator Element 3 exam course. In this lesson, we go over the G7A questions. The G7A questions cover power supplies, transmitters and receivers, filters, and schematic drawing symbols. And I'll be honest with you, this is a long lesson. There are 24 questions in this section. Uh, however, the good thing is, is that most of these questions are rehashes from the technician exam, just phrased a little bit differently. Plus, there's some schematics which are reviewed from the technician as well. So, kind of bear with me, but some of these questions are a bit deep, so we'll go into that. But bear with me, this, is, this one isn't that bad. What safety feature does a power supply bleeder resistor provide? Well, a power supply bleeder resistor discharges the filter capacitors. So basically, this, this is put in line with a uh, capacitor so that the charge, once the power is turned off, has some place to go from the capacitor, capacitor's electric field. And what this does is it helps prevent shock. So basically, by providing the, the electric field some place to, to go, um, it, it basically dissipates the, the filter capacitors. So if you think bleeding off of power supply and bleeder resistors, that'll help help you with this question. What components are used in a power supply filter network? And this one is the standard capacitor and inductor combination. Um, when you see filter networks, you, you can think capacitors and inductors, the, the LC networks, if you will. A, a characteristic of capacitance is that it resists changes in voltage. and one of the characteristics of inductance is that it resists changes in current. And because of these characteristics, capacitors and inductors can be used together to basically smooth power output or and from power supplies and provide, you know, a nice smooth even keeled current. What should be the minimum peak inverse voltage rating of the rectifier in a full wave power supply? The answer is double the normal peak output voltage of the power supply. So this one takes a little bit of review to get all the aspects of this question, but first thing you got to know is that a rectifier, which is, is essentially a diode, and only allows current to flow in one direction. And peak inverse voltage is the voltage that is required for current to flow in the non-conductive direction across a rectifier or a diode, and this is generally a bad thing as it usually wrecks the, the rectifier. So to be safe, the peak inverse voltage should be twice the normal peak output of the power supply, and that's one way to think of it. So it doesn't matter if it's a full wave or half wave or whatever type of power supply. It should always be double the normal peak output voltage of the power supply. What should be the approximate minimum peak inverse voltage rating of the rectifier in a half wave power supply? And the answer is, again, is two times the normal peak output voltage of the power supply. So think of the last question. Essentially, um, the peak inverse voltage should be a lot more than the peak voltage of the, the power supply. What should be the impedance of a low-pass filter as compared to the impedance of the transmission line into which it is inserted? And the answer is about the same. And if you think about it, this kind of makes sense. You just got to kind of sit back and look at the, asp the, the different parts of this question. So what this is asking is what relationship should the impedance of a low-pass filter be to the transmission line? And the answer is, of course, roughly the same. And if you think about it, up to this point, you haven't seen any question where you didn't want impedances to match. So essentially, another way of stating this is that you want those two impedances to match. And if you think low SWR and all that other stuff, that'll help remind you of this question. But usually, for the purpose of the exam at least, you want impedances to match, and this is that type of question. Which of the following might be used to process signals from the balance modulator and send them to the mixer in a single sideband phone transmitter? Of the possible circuits on the answers, the, the correct one is a filter. And to get this question right, the first thing you needed to look at in the question is that this is a single sideband transmitter. So we're looking at the process in a single sideband transmitter. If you remember from some of the review from some of the previous lessons, a single sideband signal is an amplitude modulated signal, so an AM type of signal. And it has the carrier wave and one of the sidebands from the AM signal cut off, making it a single sideband signal. So the basic breakdown for how this works is that you have an oscillator, which produces a carrier wave. And this carrier wave is just a blank canvas. It's, it's a wave at a certain frequency. So this carrier wave is sent to the balanced modulator, 
where it is combined with a audio frequency from a microphone, so an audio signal. Now these two signals mix together and you have basically a basic amplitude modulated signal with two sidebands and a carrier wave. Now to make this into a single sideband signal you need to cut away the, one of those carrier waves and one of those single sideband um, side, one of the sidebands. So you have to do this through a filter. So from the balance modulator that signal that AM signal is sent to the filter where it cuts the carrier wave and one of the sidebands making it a single sideband signal. So from there it goes to the mixer which where it's combined with another frequency from an oscillator and the product of these combining these two frequencies is the frequency at which you want to transmit. So if you're trying to do 20 meters it's going to be, you know, 14 megahertz something, but this is the, the transmit frequency. It gets pumped through and sent through the antenna. So what you're looking for here is the thing that processes this, this two sidebands and carrier wave into a single sideband, which is the filter. Which circuit is used to combine signals from the carrier oscillator and speech amplifier and send the result to the filter in a typical single sideband phone transmitter? And we'll use this this uh, um, graph again, and I know it's not electronically correct because a mixer is supposed to be a circle and the amplifier is supposed to be whatever, but um, the answer is a balance modulator. And basically that speech amplifier is the signal coming from your microphone. and when that signal is combined with the carrier wave in the balanced modulator, that frequency, that signal that is produced from that goes to the filter, and that's where the carrier and the one of the sidebands gets cut off to make make it a single sideband signal. What circuit is used to process signals from the RF amplifier and local oscillator and send the result to the IF filter in a super heterodyne receiver? And the answer is a mixer. And this is a review from, a little bit of a review from the technician, but we've, we've talked about this a bit before. Um, remember that a, a superhead receiver takes an incoming signal and mixes it with a signal from an oscillator to make an intermediate frequency for, for processing. And this mixer and oscillator combination is one of the things that identifies a uh, receiver as a superhead or a dyne receiver because of the mixing of signals. Now, um, the, gra the chart here is from the technician exam, and I circled uh, the mixer piece. So basically, when um, a signal comes in from an antenna, and the RF amplifier may take that signal and amplify it, which helps helps you know the receiver gives it a little bit more signal to work with. And it's not pictured here, but sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. From the RF amplifier, it goes to the mixer, where it's mixed with another signal from the oscillator to produce the intermediate frequency. What circuit is used to process signals from the IF amplifier and BFO and send the result to the AF amplifier in a single sideband phone superheterodyne receiver? And the answer for this one is product detector. And we, we talked about this before in the technician exam too. In fact, the little picture here is from the technician exam. So if you remember that in a single sideband and CW receivers, you have to use a beat frequency oscillator and product detector to transform the intermediate frequency produced by the mixer and the oscillator combination into an audio signal your ear can understand. The other thing you need to know for this question is that an AF amplifier stands for audio frequency amplifier. So this amplifies the audio signal produced by the product detector to the speaker. So essentially it's just the, the beat frequency oscillator and the product detector, what they do is they turn the in intermediate frequency, whatever frequency that is, into an a, a audible frequency, so it changes the wavelength the, into a sound, essentially. So, for this one, box 1 in this picture, in figure T6, is a product detector. What is an advantage of a crystal-controlled transmitter? Well, the advantage of crystal-controlled transmitters are they're very stable. They have a stable output frequency. And the, this is the primary advantage of a crystal-controlled transmitter, and it's only one very stable frequency. The problem with a crystal controlled transmitter is that to change bands or frequencies you will need to switch out crystals, which is which is a big disadvantage. However, the one thing it's got going for it is that it's extremely stable. What is the simplest combination of stages that can be combined to implement a super heterodyne receiver? And the answer is an HF oscillator, a mixer, and a detector. 
and this is the basic skeleton of a super het receiver and all the other bells and whistles, the filters, the amplifiers, all that stuff just adds to the performance of the receiver so it improves the receiver's selectivity and sensitivity. So if the receiver consists of the oscillator mixer combination and then the detector, that is a basic super heterodyne receiver. What type of receiver is suitable for CW and single sideband reception but does not require a mixer stage or an IF amplifier? And the answer is a direct conversion receiver. And the thing to take away from this question to get th this answer right is that it does not require an IF amplifier, so there's no IF involved with this, or intermediate frequency involved with this. So a, a direct conversion receiver is a type of heterodyne receiver. So it's like a super head, but it's simpler. It, it take, it, a direct conversion receiver converts the in incoming RF signal from the antenna directly into audio frequency. So there's no intermediate frequency produced for further filtering or whatever, like in a super heterodyne. Essentially, all a direct conversion receiver consists of is a mixer and an oscillator which feeds into an audio frequency filter and amplifier. So basically it turns direct, it turns the signal coming in from the antenna directly into audio frequency th through a mixer and oscillator combination. Um, so this mixer and oscillator will serve the same function as the product detector in a beat oscillator, beat frequency oscillator in a single sideband CW super heterodyne receiver. So instead of producing an intermediate frequency for the super head to further filter and process, the mixer oscillator just turns the RF in directly into AF. And you can look back at some of the other pictures of this, but all you need to know for a direct conversion is that it converts directly from RF to AF. What type of circuit is used in many FM receivers to convert signals coming from the IF amplifier to audio? The answer is the discriminator. And remember from the technician class and all that, if you, when you see discriminator, think FM. The discriminator in an FM receiver performs the same function as a product detector does in a super heterodyne receiver. So it turns an IF signal or intermediate frequency signal into an audio frequency signal that your ear can hear. So block one in figure T7, which is once again from the technician exam, is a discriminator. And that, by identifying that block as a discriminator, that makes this an FM receiver. Which of the following is a desirable characteristic for capacitors used to filter the DC output of a switching power supply? The answer is low equivalent series resistance. And equivalent series resistance, or ESR, is a side effect of capacitance. So capacitors resist change in voltage, and we talked a little bit about that, but we didn't go into any detail. But as AC is applied to a capacitor, it will dissipate its electric charge back and forth as the current switches direction. Now this has an effect on the circuit as if there was, this just discharging of their electric charge has an effect on the circuit as if there was a resistor in series with the capacitor. So when this happens, it, it's almost like resistance is added to the, to the circuit. How big this imaginary resistor is, the is the capacitor's equivalent series resistance. So basically, however big that resistance effect, or how many ohms that resistor will have on that circuit, is the equivalent series resistance. So a low ESR means the capacitors will not cause big voltage fluctuations from basically the resisting of the change in voltage and keep everything smooth. So when you're dealing with power supplies and you want a smooth output flow of power, you want to keep everything as smooth as possible, which means you don't want to have that capacitor resisting a lot of voltage as you know current goes back, switches direction on it. So a low ESR um, is the advantage or the desirable characteristic for capacitors used in power supplies. Which of the following is an advantage of a switched mode power supply as compared to a linear power supply? Now the advantage is a high frequency operation allows the use of smaller components. And this one takes a little bit of explanation. It may be best to, to just memorize this one, but a linear power supply does not change the AC frequency of the AC current feeding into it. A switched mode power supply significantly increases the AC frequency which allows the use of smaller components in its construction. So uh, a linear power supply are, are relatively simple. Um, switch mode power supplies are much more complex, however they're a lot smaller. 
which is the advantage. They contain an oscillator to increase the AC frequency, which adds adds more gadgets to the circuit. However, you know, because of the higher frequency, you can use smaller parts. And there's a whole lot of technical stuff about mutual inductance and inductive reactants and a bunch of other stuff to explain this question. But like I said, this one may be one you just want to, for this for simplicity's sake, just memorize the answer. What portion of the AC cycle is converted to DC by a half wave rectifier? Well, if it's a half wave, it's going to convert half of the AC signal or AC cycle. So if you think of an AC cycle as this picture here, uh, as a sine wave, you know the whole peak, the trough from going from zero up all the way down and back up to zero is one wave. Now, the part of the signal that's above the zero line is you know, what the the DC is going to be converted to DC in a half wave rectifier. And what's below that line is going to get ignored. So to to get this one correct, you need to know that an AC cycle is is basically a 360 degrees sine wave. And if you're dealing with a half wave rectifier um, or, or diode, you will convert half of that AC cycle. So half of 360 degrees is 180 degrees. What portion of the AC cycle is converted to DC by a full wave rectifier? Well, building off the last question, a full wave rectifier will take 360 degrees of that AC cycle and convert it to DC. Now, the way this is done is that because this, the power is switching back and forth and the diode will only, or the rectifier will only allow the current to flow in one direction, to get both directions that the AC cycle is flowing in, you're going to need to use two diodes. So one for one direction of the current and the other for the other direction of the current, and they combine. And the result is that both the AC cycle above the line is converted to DC, and then the AC cycle that's below, or going the other direction below the line, is also converted to DC going in the same direction, and the graph looks a little bit like uh, two camel humps or two mountains. Um, now, with the advantage is that this makes more efficient use of the AC cycle by capturing the entire cycle, as opposed to just half the cycle, like in a half wave rectifier. So, a full wave rectifier will collect 360 degrees of the AC cycle. What is the output waveform of an unfiltered full wave rectifier connected to a resistive load? The answer is a series of DC pulses at twice the frequency of the AC input. All right, so to this one, you really need a kind of a graphical depiction here. And I got these two pictures from the sine wave and the full wave rectifier here. And this kind of explains it. All right, so you're converting a, a full wave, uh, a full cycle, a full AC cycle into um, basically DC. So you're taking a, a current that goes one direction and switches into another direction and combining both of those together to make everything go in one direction. So if you look at the first picture on the left, the first hump in a half wave rectifier is the only thing that's converted into DC power. And then time passes as the current's going the other direction, and then when it starts flowing in the re direction of the rectifier again, it'll convert that stuff into DC power. So all you get is a bip, 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 with a pause in between the bips as the current is switched direction the other way. So in a full wave rectifier, the you have the both the positive and the negative sides of the AC cycle going the same direction now. So instead of that bip, 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 those two diodes are working together and they're, they're basically making it bip, 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 bip. So you have two twice as many peaks in the DC direction as you would in a half wave rectifier. And I know that's probably clear as mud, but um, basically you're just folding that wave up so you have twice as many pulses than you would with a half wave rectifier. Which symbol in figure G71 represents a fixed resistor? Okay, finally some simple stuff. This is all technician class review. All right, a, a, of the possible answers, there's several fixed resistors, and, and a fixed resistor is a resistor with a fixed value. Um, there's several fixed resistors in this uh, in this figure. Um, of the possible answers, the only one that is a fixed resistor is symbol number three, and I got that circled in red here. There's nothing fancy about it, it's just a normal resistor. 
Which symbol in figure G71 represents a single cell battery? The answer is symbol 13, and this is the same schematic for a battery that you learned under the technician exam, except this time there's just two, two lines, a short and a long one, parallel to each other, uh, as opposed to several lines um, that the average schematic has. So just kind of know that one um, so it doesn't trick you up, but those two lines there, that represents a single cell battery. Which symbol in figure G71 represents a NPN transistor? And this one's symbol 4. Now, for this one, you, you know what the symbol for a transistor is. Now, the memory trick for a NPN transistor vice a PNP transistor is that an NPN transi transistor never points in. So the little diode um, arrow in, in the transistor schematic points out for an NPN never points in transistor. Which symbol in figure G71 represents a variable capacitor? And this one is symbol 5. And we didn't go over this one in technician, but um, you know what the symbol for capacitor looks like. Uh, we did go over variable inductors and variable resistors, and both of those are characterized by an arrow going through them. And nothing's different with a capacitor. It's a, it's a, a normal capacitor symbol with a little arrow going through it and it's circled there on the, on the picture, it's number 5. Which symbol in figure G71 represents a transformer? And you know this one, it's symbol 6, it's the only transformer on the page. There's no tricks, and it's no different than what you learned for the technician exam. Which symbol in figure G71 represents a single pole switch? Once again, it's a simple one, it's symbol 11, it's the only switch on the page, um, and it's the same schematic that you learned for the technician exam. And that is finally it for the G7A review, and it's time for the G7A quiz. And I'm going to recommend that if you're watching this on YouTube, that uh, you go to hamwhisper.com and watch it on this lesson's page. I'm going to have the uh, figure G71 posted there above the video, so that might help um, when working with those questions on the quiz. So take out a pen and a piece of paper and number 1 through 24. and I'm going to go through the questions pretty quick, so if you need more time, just pause the video and take all the time you need. And with that said, let's get started. Question 1. What safety feature does a power supply bleeder resistor provide? A. It acts as a fuse for excess voltage. B. It discharges the filter capacitors. C. It removes shock hazards from the induction coils. Or D. It eliminates ground loop current. What components are used in a power supply filter network? A. Diodes B. Transformers and transistors C. Quartz crystals or D. Capacitors and inductors Question 3. What should be the minimum peak inverse voltage rating of the rectifier in a full wave power supply? A. One quarter the normal output voltage of the power supply B. Half the normal output voltage of the power supply C. Double the normal peak output voltage of the power supply, or D. Equal to the out normal output voltage of the power supply. Question 4. What should be the approximate minimum peak inverse voltage rating of the rectifier in a half-wave power supply? A. One half the normal peak output voltage of the power supply. B. Half the normal output voltage of the power supply. C. Equal to the normal output voltage of the power supply or D, two times the normal peak output voltage of the power supply. Question 5. What should be the impedance of a low-pass filter as compared to the impedance of the transmission line into which it is inserted? A, substantially higher, B, about the same, C, substantially lower, or D, twice the transmission line impedance? Question 6. Which of the following might be used to process signals from the balanced modulator and send them to a mixer in a single sideband phone transmitter? A. Carrier oscillator B. Filter C. IF amplifier or D. RF amplifier Question 7. Which circuit is used to combine signals from the carrier oscillator and speech amplifier and send the result to the filter in a typical single sideband phone transmitter? A. Mixer B. Detector C. IF amplifier or D. Balanced modulator Question 8. 
One circuit is used to process signals from the RF amplifier and local oscillator and send the result to the IF filter in a super heterodyne receiver. A. Balanced modulator B. IF amplifier C. Mixer or D. Detector Question 9. What circuit is used to process signals from the IF amplifier and BFO and send the result to the AF amplifier in a single sideband phone hetero super heterodyne receiver? A. RF oscillator B. IF filter C. Balanced modulator or D. Product detector Question 10. What is an advantage of a crystal controlled transmitter? A. Stable output frequency B. Excellent modulation clarity C. Ease of switching between bands or D. Ease of changing frequency Question 11. What is the simplest combination of stages that can be combined to implement a super heterodyne receiver? A. RF amplifier, detector, audio amplifier B. RF amplifier, mixer, IF amplifier C. HF oscillator, mixer, detector or D. HF oscillator, product detector, audio amplifier Question 12. What type of receiver is suitable for CW and single sideband reception but does not require a mixer stage or an IF amplifier? A. A super regenerative receiver B. A TRF receiver C. A super heterodyne receiver or D. A direct conversion receiver Question 13. What type of circuit is used in many FM receivers to convert signals from the IF amplifier to audio? A. Product detector B. Phase inverter C. Mixer or D. Discriminator Question 14. Which of the following is a desirable characteristic for capacitors used to filter the DC output of a switching power supply? A. Low equivalent series resistance B. High equivalent series resistance C. Low temperature coefficient or D. High temperature coefficient Question 15. Which of the following is an advantage of a switched mode power supply as compared to a linear power supply? A. Faster switching time makes higher output voltage possible. B. Fewer circuit components are required. C. High frequency operation allows the use of smaller components. Or D. All of these choices are correct. Question 16. What portion of the AC cycle is converted to DC by a half wave rectifier? A. 90 degrees B. 180 degrees C. 270 degrees or D. 360 degrees Question 17. Which portion of the AC cycle is converted to DC by a full wave rectifier? A. 90 degrees B. 180 degrees C. 270 degrees or D. 360 degrees Question 18. What is the output waveform of an unfiltered full wave rectifier connected to a resistive load? A. A series of DC pulses at twice the frequency of the AC input B. A series of DC pulses at the same frequency as the AC input C. A sine wave at half the frequency of the AC input or D. A steady DC voltage Question 19. Which symbol in figure G71 represents a fixed resistor? A. Symbol 2 B. Symbol 6 C. Symbol 3 or D. Symbol 12 Question 20. Which symbol in figure G71 represents a single cell battery? A. Symbol 5 B. Symbol 12 C. Symbol 8 or D. Symbol 13 Question 21. Which symbol in figure G71 represents an NPN transistor? A. Symbol 2 B. Symbol 4 C. Symbol 10 or D. Symbol 12 Question 22. Which symbol in figure G71 represents a variable capacitor? A. Symbol 2 B. Symbol 11 C. Symbol 5 or D. Symbol 12 Question 23. Which symbol in figure G71 represents a transformer? A. Symbol 6 B. Symbol 4 C. Symbol 10 or D. Symbol 2 Question 24. Which symbol in figure G71 represents a single pole switch? 
A, symbol 2, B, symbol 3, C, symbol 11, or D, symbol 12. And that is finally it for lesson 26 in the G7A section. So now that you're done with the quiz, stop by hamwhisper.com and check the answers. They are under the G7A section of the answer exam answers page. So you might want to, there's a lot of information in this lesson, you may want to go over it a couple times. And I don't know if you retained it all, and I don't know if I explained it well, but you know, there's a lot of stuff here regardless. So until next time, and lesson 27, this is Andy, KE4GKP, saying 73, and I hope to hear you on the air soon.